Okay, I think we've got a few more people still joining us, but in interest of time, we've got quite a lot to cover. Um, so I think I'll get I'll get going. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, hello. I think we're okay. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I know we've got people all over the world, so it might be the end of your day in Asia, or you're just waking up in the US, um, or like the rest of us in Europe, this is probably around your lunchtime. Um, so wherever you are, a very warm welcome. Um, we've got quite a bit to cover today. Thanks so much for all of your questions. Around 300 people have registered for this session. Um, and there was lots of questions. Um, and the agenda for today um, has been driven by them. So there's a number of things we're going to cover. We're going to look at the format of the program, the curriculum, um, the class profile, uh, your alumni network, um, and other key areas were career development, um, fees, scholarships, funding, um, and the admissions process. And I know there was a number of questions around the GMAT, so I'm happy to address them as well. Um, understandably, actually, a big question that came up um, was about COVID and the impact of that on, on teaching and how that's looking at the school. Um, so many people are asking about that, so probably useful to, to give a summary at this stage. Um, so we've been continuing teaching um, throughout, throughout the pandemic. Um, so understandably, a lot of our classes uh, moved online. Um, and currently we've got uh, a combination of um, online delivery in some cases or hybrid delivery um, where the school's COVID secure and, and people are coming in in a, in a socially distanced way um, and experiencing teaching with also the option to join online. Um, so at the moment, we've got kind of safe and flexible options there. Um, the programme that's beginning in January, um, due to the current situation, uh, will be beginning online and then moving to in-person teaching um, as soon as it's safe and feasible to do so. Um, but the September programme, which I think many of you joining this session will have in mind, um, this is really for people at the early research stage looking to put together a, a strong application or, or find out more. That programme is currently scheduled to, to be delivered in person um, in the way that we've done for, for many years at the school. Um, so we'll be focusing on that, on that today. Um, if, of course, we find ourselves in a situation in September um, similar to, to the situation currently, and we hope not, um, we will be flexible then as well. Um, so I hope that helps kind of address that at, at, at this early stage. Um, the other question um, that came up a lot is kind of why, why Oxford? Um, and you're on this session today because you're looking for personal growth, personal career development, um, and whether you're kind of already in a senior role, you're looking to have more impact, perhaps you're um, in a kind of functional role and they're looking for kind of a broader, more, more, more senior position. Um, or you're looking to bring about some kind of change or, or transition in terms of your, your career journey, you'll be thinking, I guess, about what's the right program for you. Um, and that's really what, what I'd like to start thinking about um, and tell you a bit more in terms of the Oxford Executive MBA. So this image, some of you may, may be familiar with, it's um, kind of one of the most famous landmarks in, in Oxford, and it's, it's the image that tends to come to mind when people think about the University of Oxford. Um, so here we've got the Radcliffe camera, camera coming from the Latin word for room. Uh, this was built around 1740 um, and is there to, um, uh, it forms part of the Bodleian Library. Um, next to it, you can see one of Oxford's colleges. This is All Souls College. Um, and it really does bring to mind um, that when you join the executive MBA, um, you're joining a, a business school, but you're also becoming an, an Oxonian. Um, and with that, you have the architecture and, and the traditions um, and all of those things that you'd expect. But it also means in terms of your teaching, um, we're going to teach you about business, but actually you're going to have exposure to um, economics, science, politics, international relations, um, all of the things that we believe global leaders will need to be successful over and above management practice. Um, so essentially, when you join Oxford, you're learning about business, but you're learning about more than business as well. 
This is the business school. So many of you on this call may have been to Oxford. Many of you may have not have been to Oxford, but if you have, you may have walked um, or gone past this or possibly even visited or studied with us before. Um, this is the business school. We are very kind of modern facilities with the second youngest department of the university. Um, and it means against the backdrop of all the history and traditions of, of Oxford, the business school is very much about preparing people for the future. Um, so whether that's looking at the future of marketing, um, thinking about the future of real estate and our, in, in our research, um, understanding how AI is going to impact business in the future. We're very much about um, thinking about innovation and future challenges um, and preparing people to, to take them on in global roles. Um, so when you join the Oxford Executive MBA, you have the best of all the old, but you also have the best of the new as well. Another thing that I think is really important for you to think about when thinking about what would be your preferred executive MBA programme is to consider the format. Um, in broad terms, an executive MBA is um, different from an MBA, um, so it's a part-time programme. And unlike an MBA um, that you study full-time, that's more of an early career programme, an executive MBA is for experienced managers. Um, it's not a weekend program, so people study in week long blocks. Okay, so that means over two years, and the program is approximately two years, two years long. Um, you will either be in Oxford or one of our international locations um, approximately every five to six weeks. Um, we have two classes that begin each year. So we have a class that begins in January and a class that begins in September, um, and they both have around 70 students in them. Your first year and a good part of your second year, you will study all the core subjects and we'll, we'll touch on them in a moment. And then in your second year, you'll shape the program around your own um, objectives. Um, so you will choose four electives that you wish to study um, and they may be international electives. So we have an international elective in South Africa, another one in the US um, and two of our core modules that everyone will do together One's in China um, and one's in India. Um, and then the core themes of the programme. So entrepreneurial thinking is a really key part of, um, of what we, uh, you know, revisit throughout the programme, um, along with strategic leadership, really about building leaders who are going to take the most senior positions in, in, in the global context. Here's all of the core curriculum. So these are all of the core areas you will cover um, when you come to study here at the school. Um, I won't go into the details of every single module right now because we've got quite a lot to cover. But I think the key thing when you're looking at these subject areas is the approach that we'll take is very much encouraging you to um, understand what the right questions are to ask, um, have the tools and frameworks to, um, to apply. Um, and feel that you can then go on and make better and better informed decisions for better outcomes for your organization. Um, so briefly in the areas of leadership, it'll really about thinking about what are the frameworks for um, uh, team and organizational performance. We'll consider things like leadership style, personal reputation, um, and really what your role is as, as a leader in, in the global economy. Strategy is probably worth touching on. It's normally one of the, uh, the courses that people find most helpful or most drawn to in terms of an executive MBA program. Um, and that'll be over and above teaching about how to formulate a strategic plan. We'll also give you the skills to um, be able to interrogate them and advocate for them, um, which is a real kind of career booster for those senior level positions um, in which you're going to need to expand or innovate. These are some of the electives that you could that you could choose from. So we offer a range um, a range of electives. Predominantly, they'll all be delivered in Oxford during your second year. Um, however, the fintech elective is currently uh, delivered in London. Um, entrepreneurial finance is the US elective, so that's delivered in the Silicon Valley and is a really exciting course with some amazing speakers um, that will come and 
um, uh, and be in conversation with you. Um, and we also have inclusive business, which was delivered in Cape Town, um, which is all about how do we build businesses that um, are not only profitable, but responsible as well. This is going to be a little bit of a flavour of, uh, of what a week would look like at the school. Um, so it's pretty full on in terms of um, everything that you'll be studying. Um, and in every course week, you'll be studying a number of subjects. Um, so we don't, for example, have a week of business finance and then a week of accounting and so on. There tends to be overlap um, because we believe it's a better way for you to, for you to learn and for the programme to flow. Um, so in addition to your lectures, you'll be in breakout rooms um, discussing the issues and applying them to case studies. We'll also have sessions from our um, careers development team, and I'm going to talk a little bit about their offering um, shortly as well. Um, and uh, all of your meals are also normally delivered or served here at the school. A key part of the programme would be your assessments. So um, people are often curious at this stage as, uh, as to what that would look like. Um, so for every course that you study, there's, um, there's an assessment you'll need to complete. So that will either be um, an essay or coursework you need to submit, or it'll be um, a sit down examination. Um, so every course, whether that's the core elements or the elective elements, um, will have an assessment piece to go with it. We also have two key group projects. So the whole class, um, well, everyone in the class will work in an entrepreneurship project in groups, which is the closest thing that we have to um, say a dissertation, where you have to present a business idea and also an accompanying business plan. Um, and then we also have the Oxford Global Opportunities and Threats project, um, which again, people will work on in groups. And this is where you take a particular global challenge or global issue and present ideas or solutions around that. Um, currently, we're each year looking at a different UN um, sustainable development goal. So as part of your program, you'll be thinking about business ideas or propositions to help ad address or achieve that goal. One of the key things that came up in terms of your questions is kind of understanding who you'd be studying with. Um, so this is a class that joined us in September. They're now on their second, second module. Um, and in some ways, they're fairly typical of, a, of an executive MBA class. Um, some ways, possibly a little bit different. Um, so you can see it's a really international um, group. So usually we have around 30 or plus nationalities on the program. We have 40 nationalities join us recently. Um, it's an experience class. So the average age was 40. More typically, the average age is 38, 39, so, so not too far off. Um, but the age range is broad. Um, so unlike an MBA program, um, where most people tend to be a you know, much kind of narrower field, um, for the executive MBA, we may have a few people in their early 30s, um, and then we have people up to um, mid 50s, and, and in this case, 60s as well, um, as people are working longer and also um, getting into leadership positions earlier, we see a kind of very broad range. Um, we have 25% women on the on the on the course. Typically, we've seen more, um, you know, 35-40% women. So we have slightly less women for this particular intake. Um, but in terms of sectors, again, very very diverse. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So you may be looking for where you are currently um, on the map. This is a breakdown of nationalities um, rather than where people are based. For example, around 30% of the class are UK based, but 20% of UK nationality. Um, but it gives you an idea of the global reach of the program. Um, typically the, the US, the UK and, and the rest of Europe make up our, our biggest groups, but we'll have you know, regional representation from all over the world. Um, we're probably one of the most global programs in that all of these different groups are now coming together in one place to study, um, which really enriches your experience um, and also makes it a really exciting program for us. Um, obviously, Oxford's got a very um, strong global reputation. Um, so we attract people from all over the world. 
equally by offering the week-long format. Um, we believe that that makes it easier for people, whether you're in Hong Kong or South Africa um, or you know San Francisco, wherever you may be, to join us at that school and really concentrate on your studies for that week. Here's a little bit of breakdown of, of sectors. Um, I think the main point to make here when you're thinking about your future classmates um, is you know, how diverse you want your group to be. Um, as on most executive MBAs, financial services, um, professional services, consulting, always reasonably represent, well represented. Um, but on our executive MBA, you will have people from a really broad range of of backgrounds. So on a recent class, we had um, you know, an entrepreneur from Los Angeles with um, a, you know, a plant biologist in London, um, with a CFO from Brazil. Um, so you know, people from not just many different countries, but lots of different professionals, um, uh, you know, lots, lots of different sectors as well, um, and uh, lots of different types of organizations. So it's a really interesting group of people. Thinking about your class, I'd also um, think it's useful to think about your wider network. So your class is, uh, is gonna form one of your strongest um, networks, but equally as a student of the university, you will be part of the business school and therefore our alumni network, which I'll talk about now, but you'll also have a college network that you'll join. Um, and you'll also be part of the wider University of Oxford alumni. The Oxford OBA network, as we call it, um, that forms uh, or um, is made up of around 20,000 um, members. Um, so it's growing rapidly um, and it's very global. So there's 21 um, OBA chapters all over the world. Um, and to have a chapter in a particular city, we need a minimum of 50 or more alumni there. Um, and as a result, they're growing all the time. So I believe Toronto, Melbourne, um, Lagos are all reasonably new chapters. Um, so our alumni network's ever expanding, but also gives you the opportunity to make regional connections. Alumni chapters will offer opportunities for networking, for events, um, and also for social activities as well particularly useful if you move to a new city or you're planning to take a, a new post in a new region and you want to quickly form a network there. Um, you can tap into to our alumni network and their supportive um, and interesting groups for you to join. Many people are asking about our career service. Um, we're very proud of the uh, investment that's been made in particularly for our executive MBAs um, in our career service. Um, and we have a dedicated team here at the school um, that help you not just in terms of understanding where you'd like to go next, but also helping you make, make that move. Um, generally, our careers team tend to tell us that people come to them, you know, with, with a number of different um, kind of directions they could go in. It's either about acceleration, it's about change, um, they're perhaps looking to start their own venture, or, and it's not unusual if this is you, they're a little bit of a crossroads and that they're unsure um, you know, which, which direction they'd like to take next and they'd like some advice with that. Broadly speaking, our careers team support our students um, in four different ways. One way is really about coaching and understanding where you might like to go. Um, and we would call this kind of career direction and planning. The next stage is more specifically helping you on your job search. So understanding what um, organizational connections we have, what would be your target organizations, what types of roles um, are most appropriate um, and making inroads there. At application stage, we do um, mock interviews, we help people with their LinkedIn profiles or understanding the specific requirements of different organizations in terms of their recruitment process. Um, and finally, we have um, advice on how you negotiate um, your package, whether that's dealing with um, executive search agencies or directly with organizations. Um, that's another area where we would continue to, to support you. Often, um, people use our career service not just to 
um, change job, but also to change industry. So it's also useful. It's also useful for you to note that we have industry advisors that specialize in different sectors. Um, so whether you're looking to move into FMCG or private equity um, or whatever it may be, we will have an industry advisor that will be able to support you and provide you advice. Um, and our careers development team would organize that for you. And we have a dedicated platform as well to help you set up various um, appointments at a convenient time that would be useful to your next step. Financing, um, moving on from careers, financing was a, a key part of the questions that came up and, and understandably, um, you know, the value of an executive MBA will last for, for a lifetime, but it's a significant um, investment now and we recognize that. So here I'm just gonna touch a bit more on what funding options are available to you um, and particularly go into a bit more detail about our scholarships as well. Um, for the September 21 class, the program fee is £94,800, so just under £95,000, um, and that excludes uh, any travel or accommodation costs. So when thinking about your overall budget, you'll, you'll, you want to include them. Um, many candidates coming onto the program explore um, private loans, and one of them that's most popular is the Progeny Finance Loan. Um, we'd ask you to look into that independently, um, but I thought it was worth highlighting. Um, it's particularly, I think, attractive because the repayment period's um, quite long and with no kind of early repayment penalty. Um, people often find that attractive option. Um, so that's maybe something to, to consider. Um, and also we would like as many of you as possible to, to apply for the various scholarships that we have on offer. Um, so to talk in a bit more detail, we have two scholarships, scholarships that are, um, are specifically for women. Um, so we have the Forte Foundation Fellowships um, for Women. We have one of this, one scholarship, one Forte scholarship per class, um, which is worth 30,000 pounds towards the programme fees. And then we have two more women's scholarships, um, which are worth 50% of the programme fees. And that's the ones in association with the 30% club. Um, so for every class, we will have one forte and two 30% club scholarships, and they're, they're, you know, they're reasonably weighty in terms of the programme fees. Um, the criteria for them are around um, professional. There's also an element of um, wishing to inspire others and, um, and also be an ambassador for the school. Um, and to apply for them, you need to attach an additional um, two to 400 word um, statement to your application. Um, we have the Hasmut Patel Scholarship, which is a new scholarship um, uh, that we're able to offer. And that's for candidates of African nationality who are ordinarily based in an African country. Um, and that's a full scholarship. Um, in order to be considered for that, you would make your um, normal program application, but the criteria would be um, kind of being a very um, strong candidate, um, but also an intention to um, contribute to, to Africa's development as well. Um, you don't need to do an additional statement for that, but you will need to apply by an earlier deadline, and I'll touch on deadlines shortly. The scholarships which everyone can apply for, and I'd encourage you to do so, because a, a good number are awarded per class, are the Ember Directors Awards. Um, these are for any candidate, and the criteria is again around the strength of your academic and professional achievements, but also there's an element there of diversity. So being able to demonstrate what you're going to bring to the class, which is which is different from others, um, and also about positive impact. So if you were awarded the award, if you awarded the award, um, if you won the award, you know how would this be um, have a positive impact not just on you, but your organisation or your sector or your region in the long term. Um, and to be considered for that, that again, an additional statement, two to 400 words as to how you meet that criteria. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on to deadlines shortly. We also have the Oxford Alumni Scholarship. So they're for people who have been awarded a degree bearing um, qualification from, from the university. Um, there's no additional statement for that. Um, and that's worth 50% of the programme fee. So if you are Oxford alum, you should definitely apply by the deadline. Um, the earlier deadline for that in order to be considered for that. 
finally, it is worth having a look at the University of Oxford website, um, the broader website rather than the school's website, because that has a search tool on there where you can put in your um, personal profile and information. And there may be um, specific scholarships out there that may apply to you as an individual um, that's worth exploring. So admission requirements, um, many people are asking about this. Um, so I'll make sure we've got enough time to go into, go into some detail there. Um, all of our applications are online. Um, so you will need to gather up all the, uh, all the different documents and information um, and upload them to our online system by the deadlines, um, which I'll highlight shortly. Um, within that, that includes your academic transcripts um, so from any undergrad or postgraduate study, uh, and your degree transcript is the document that's got the breakdown of marks you got on each element of your degree, so on your degree certificate. Um, and if you have this, great, you can upload it. Um, if not, you need to request that from your, from your institution. Um, there was a question actually that came up uh, as part of um, the registrations for today about what to do if you do, you do not hold a degree. Um, so it's, it's usually we would expect candidates coming onto the programme when they apply to hold a degree. However, if you don't and you've got strong professional experience, um, you should still um, apply for the programme because if you do so and you've got a really great career track record um, and also you have a high GMAT or executive assessment score um, and submit a strong application, um, then we do have maybe a few candidates, a uh, few um, applicants each year that come onto the program that do not hold a degree. So that doesn't necessarily rule you out. So I hope that answers that question. There was lots of questions about the GMAT. So there is a GMAT requirement um, in terms of applying for the program. So you'll either need to submit um, a GMAT, full GMAT test score, or an executive, assess executive assessment score. Um, so for the GMAT, we're looking for 600 or above the executive assessment, a score of 150 or above, um, or there is the possibility to apply for a GMAT waiver, um, which you can do when you make a full application to the programme. Um, you would submit a kind of one-pager um, that outlines that you'd like to request a GMAT waiver and the reasons why you believe you should qualify for one. Um, typically, what the admissions committee will be looking for there is considerable management experience, maybe 10 years plus management experience, and or um, being able to demonstrate particularly that you would be comfortable um, with the quantitative elements of the program. So if you're from a strong finance or data or engineering background, um, because the GMAT is actually quite a good measure of how, how someone's going to be able to cope with particularly the business finance and the accounting. Um, so if you have a strong quantitative background, um, if you've got considerable management experience, um, then you can apply for, for a GMAT um, uh, waiver um, and your application uh, will go forward to the, for the, to the committee. Um, and if that's, uh, and you should move through that process. Um, alternatively, we will come back and request that you complete the GMAT in order to, in order to be considered. We need an up-to-date CV is the next key point. Um, so it's worth making sure that's really no more than three pages. I think uh, ideally one or two, but certainly no more than three pages. Um, and that you're presenting yourself in context of applying to an executive MBA rather than a job, a job application. Um, so I'd avoid too much technical or, or maybe sector specific language, assume a broad audience um, and take into account that the admissions committee will be looking for evidence of um, strategic management experience. So you want to make sure you highlight um, the progression you've had, the level of responsibility that you currently hold. We require a minimum of five years management experience. Um, most Many candidates have a lot more than that, um, but you certainly want to make it clear on your CV how you've progressed and what responsibilities you've held um, in light of applying to, to an executive MBA. You'll need to complete three essays. Um, so two of these are reasonably short. Um, so 500 words around your strengths and weaknesses. So how would, how would other people describe you? And then there's a longer um, 500 word, oh sorry, and then there's another 500 word essay 
um, which is around your career objectives. Um, so why are you looking to, uh, to, to undertake the programme? And then there's a longer 2000 word essay, um, which is around describing an issue in your organisation that you view as problematic, three different ways to address that and the strengths and weaknesses of each of those options. Um, so that essay title is on the application site, um, but that really is an opportunity for you not just to show the types of things you're thinking about in your organisation, but also to show that you can put together a good piece of written work. Um, so there's a lot of essay writing on the programme and the committee will be looking for um, candidates who can evidence their you know, writing thoughtfully, um, thinking analytically, um, and uh, you know, are taking a reflective approach to the issues that they're faced with. Finally, we need two references. Um, so we say professional or academic. In, in reality, for this program, most people use two professional references. Um, we don't stipulate it must be your current line manager, but often it would be your, your current line manager or previous line managers or other people that are more senior to you currently in your organisation. Um, so they've got to be people that have known you for a good amount of time um, in a professional capacity. Um, and are also credible, so I would avoid anybody that works for you directly or indirectly um, and focus on those who, who are senior and know you well um, and, and all also make time to complete the reference for you. In terms of the process, you would input their details onto the online app, application system and when you save that, they would receive um, an automated email from us, um, us with a link on it um, that they would click through on and to complete a statement about you. Um, there's a few prompts and directions that they're given, but hopefully it wouldn't take them more than 30 minutes or so. Um, but you'd certainly want to um, find people who will, who will make time to do that for you and obviously hopefully say, say great things. Finally, there is an English language test requirement if um, English isn't your, um, isn't your mother, mother tongue. So in, uh, there are a few exemptions around that. Um, so if you um, have studied a degree which has been taught in English, so the language of instruction was English, you wouldn't have to complete an English language test. Um, or if you've spent over 12 months um, working and living in an English speaking country or environment. Um, so it may be you're not in an English speaking country, but your corporation uses English every day as, as a language of communication. Therefore, you could make a case there. Um, so there are some exemptions around that, um, but otherwise you will like it. I need to keep the IELTS or the TOEFL tests um, and the minimum scores are all on our website if you want to have a look at them. So deadlines. Um, these are all of the application deadlines coming up for the September class. So um, the application deadlines now passed for the, I've just realised it's September 20, September 21. The application deadline is now passed for the September 21 class. Um, so we're now um, accepting applications for the September class and they've just opened and we'd advise you to apply early if you can. Um, we have a series of deadlines throughout the, throughout the year up until July. Note that in July is the final application deadline um, and we wouldn't advise you to leave, this, leave it that late if possible. Um, and no uh, awards are made on that final deadline. So if you wish to apply and be considered for a director's award, you'll need to apply by either the January, February, April or May deadline. And awards um, are made for, for, for that scholarship after each of those deadlines. For all other scholarships, so the Women's Scholarships, the Oxford Alumni Scholarship, the Hashmat Patel Scholarship, you'd need to apply by the April deadline. Um, and again, following that deadline, all applicants who've successfully applied for the programme will be considered for the, for the scholarships. Um, in terms of timing, so once you submit your application to us um, and it's been checked by our admissions team and considered complete, it'll then be passed to the um, committee for review. Um, you should find out within two to three weeks then whether you're being called to interview. Uh, the interview would then be, take place and be a one-to-one -one interview either with the program director or a senior member of her team. Um, and currently those interviews are, are happening online. 
um, you would then find out within two weeks maximum whether you're being offered a place on the programme. Um, at that point, you're given an offer pack that would include an invoice um, where you would be um, requested to pay 15% of your programme fee in order to secure your place on the programme. Um, we have a 30 day payment term on that. However, if you need more time or you'd like to await the outcome of the scholarships, then, then do let our admissions team know um, because they're, they're always happy to be flexible there, although your place isn't secured until you, until you do make that payment. Um, once you have paid your deposit, you'll also be in a position where you can consider which Oxford colleges you'd like to join. So, as I mentioned earlier, an Oxford College is a community um, outside of your department, outside of the business school, um, which enables you to kind of form networks, form connections um, with the broader university and with people in different um, uh, stages in their career, different industries, different subjects. Um, and around 10 or so Oxford Colleges consider executive MBA students. And at the point where you've got an offer of a place on the programme and you've secured that place, you will be asked then which of these colleges still considering executive MBA students would, would be your preferred option. We would then use your programme application to put you forward to that college. Um, and if they accept you, then great, you are now a member of that college. But if not, we do guarantee you a college place and we will allocate um, colleges to all. Um, so anyone joining the program who successfully applied is guaranteed a, a college place. So next steps, we're going to have probably some time for some questions now, all being well. Um, but what should you do next? So you're right at the start of the, um, the application cycle for the September class. So you've got a good amount of time now to bring your application together. Um, and ideally you would apply by um, the January, February or by latest April deadline for the program. Um, so at this point, you may want to have your CV reviewed. So we have a CV review um, area on our website where you can upload your CV there and receive feedback. Um, we have a dedicated executive MBA recruitment team and different people in that team look after different regions. So you can find your regional contact on our website and, and get in touch with them. Um, and finally, you can start your application. Once you've logged onto that system and began inputting information and uploading documents, um, you can go in and out and, and complete it as you complete essays, as your transcripts arrived, as you have references lined up. So a really good positive step would, would be to set that up and get that moving early on. Um, I think this is where we'd like you to end up. We hope that you, the session today has answered some of those key questions that you have. Um, I think we've got time for a few more questions now. So I may stop, stop this uh, video and then see which questions we've, we've come in. I know my colleagues have been um, busy answering quite a few on the Q&A. So I'm going to pick up one here. Okay, so I've got a question from um, from John. I think I've, we've met before, John. I think I picked up a note from you this morning um, to say thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and asking how much of the classroom work is group work beyond the entrepreneurship um, project and also the Oxford Go To project. And 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 quite rightly says so, so much of the the work world is group work. So that's um, that's a really good question, John. Um, so for the executive MBA, um, a good proportion of it is group work, but it is predominantly individual work. Um, and I know that's a little bit different from US schools where you will have that very much working the other, other way. So the majority of the work is group work. Um, so there is a uh, rule, if you like, of, of the University of Oxford that no more than 30% of any um, degree that's awarded can be um, more, no, no, no assessment can be more than 30% group work. 
Um, so 30% group work is the maximum we're allowed to assess you on. And we probably operate it around that. So in addition to the key group projects that you'll have, um, there'll also be um, elements of your assessment where you are called on to work in groups. Um, so, for example, on um, when we look at governance and ethics, it may be you're required to complete um, an essay, an assessment piece. But in addition to that, there's also some waiting for a group presentation as well, where you'll have to present in a group. Um, aside from the assessment, there's a huge amount of group work in terms of reflection. So everybody will be in, in learning groups. Um, and they're globally diverse um, with people, we put together people that are completely different and that comes with a whole host of challenges and, and opportunities in itself. Um, so a lot of the discussion you do and reflection and application will be in a group context, but in terms of assessment, you'll find um, we are predominantly individual assessments, but with some you know, key and regular group projects as well. So I think there's a question here which um, which some people might be thinking about actually, which was does the GMAT waiver negatively impact the application? And I think that's a really good a really good question actually is worth thinking about. Um, to give you quite an Oxford answer, I would say it does depend. Um, so in many cases, it may be that you could make a case. Um, for a GMAT waiver, um, particularly if you, you know, as I said, you've got a you know very quantitative experience, um, but it may be useful to your application in some cases to um, submit uh, to complete either the GMAT or the executive assessment, which actually takes considerably less preparation in order to bolster your application further. Um, so I would say where I would advise that to be a good idea. Um, is in cases where perhaps your undergraduate degree is not as strong as you might hope, um, or you have maybe less management experience than the average candidate applying. Um, so it is something that where in cases where you, you, you may qualify for waiver, there may be still be some advantage to you to complete it um, in order to give your application an extra edge. So it's, it is worth thinking about um, completing that. Um, if uh, you know, in conversation with your recruitment manager here at the team and talking about your and talking through your CV, it could add, add additional weight. Um, so that's a good question um, because, you know, some, sometimes a wave is great and it enables you to focus on other areas of your application. Um, in other ways, you could be missing an opportunity to, to add a bit more. Okay, a question here about references, um, and people often do grapple with, um, you know, who's who's the best reference to to put forward. Um, if we are a business owner, can a client be a professional reference? Yes, I think that's a really great idea. Um, so often, people who are, who who own their own businesses struggle a little bit thinking about who's the best person to to approach. Um, and one of the people I'd always say is, well, who's your biggest client? Who have you, who have you worked for for the longest in, in that respect? So they would be a really good option for you. Um, I'd also consider if you have kind of mentors that, that, that you've worked with for a number of years or previous line managers. Um, so if you're, you own your own business, you're, you will need to think, you know, a bit more creatively, but you're certainly thinking in terms of the right terms um, by considering a client. Um, it's definitely a Okay, another question about the GMAT. So I'm going to take this one. Um, Gemma mentioned that one could have the GMAT waiver if they had significant management experience. However, did I hear incorrectly that if one um, is admitted, they would still need to take the GMAT at a later time? Um, okay, so in terms of the GMAT, you could, and thank you for the question, it's, it's a good point, and other people might be wondering about this. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. So you could apply for the GMAT um, and um, if you get put forward to the admissions committee, um, then that GMAT waiver 
um, has been approved at that point. So we're happy to consider you at that point, you've been put forward to the committee without having completed the GMAT. However, uh, and in most cases, if your application is successful, then you'll be joining us and, 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 and that's a fantastic outcome. However, there may be some cases in um, a GMAT waiver has been approved at that first stage, um, but as a candidate moves through the process, um, there may remain a, a question mark over their ability maybe to cope with the, the, the quantitative elements of the programme. So occasionally we will have candidates who, who um, may be given a conditional offer. Um, so we'd love you to join us, but we would like you to go and complete either the GMAT or the executive assessment first um, and achieve those minimum scores enable for you in, to enable you to take up that, 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 that offer of a place. Um, so in most cases, if the GMAT waiver is approved, you, you, you will go into that process, but occasionally we may um, issue conditional offers on, on a candidate completing that. Oh, we have lots and lots of um, questions coming in. Okay, so there's a question here which I'm going to address because I didn't address it as part of the presentation, um, and I think it's uh, uh, a good question. So it's around application fee. So there is a uh, £150 application fee to apply for the programme, um, although there are a list of countries where if you're based in those countries, that application fee is, is waived. And if you go onto the how to apply section of our website, and you will see details of that, and you can click through on a link and see if your country is listed on the list of countries where you do not have to pay an application fee. Um, so there are some waivers for that, um, but otherwise it's a, it is an £100, 50, £150 application fee to, to put yourself in. Ah, okay, right. So I'm going to take this question um, here because I also think this was submitted in advance. Is the executive MBA recommended if one has done an MBA previously? Um, so again, that depends a little bit. It's, 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 um, we have seen it before. Um, would be the answer and it's not that unusual. So a good percentage of people coming onto the executive MBA have already completed some postgraduate study. Um, so it's not an application requirement. We require people to hold a degree, a good degree, um, but we don't require them to have completed postgraduate study, but many people have. Um, and in some cases that may have been an MBA. Um, so there may be a couple of people in each, in each class that have already completed an MBA coming on to do the executive MBA. Um, where that makes sense, we think, to us and, and probably to yourself as a, as a candidate, is if that MBA was completed much earlier in your career, um, if that MBA was also maybe completed in, in a different type of organisation. So sometimes people have, have completed an MBA in a more of a, a local environment, now they're looking for more of a um, kind of international environment. Um, so I think if you think that uh, completing the executive MBA um, now is going to provide considerably um, more benefit or be more timely in terms of your future career goals um, and you articulate that in your, in your application then I think that makes complete sense so we do have you know as I say a few people each year that would um, come onto the executive MBA having previously completed one um, I would say what perhaps wouldn't make sense if somebody's very recently completed um, an executive MBA at a school that's possibly similar to, um, uh, you know, similar to, to the international environment that we offer here, um, then I think the admissions committee would, would fairly question, well, how's this going to, what more is this going to give you? So if you think you can make a case and you think you can um, benefit, then that's, you know, that's certainly something that other people have, have done and, and got a huge amount from. So, um, so it does depend, but it's, it's not as unusual as you may think.
So we have a huge amount of questions. Um, And I know some of my colleagues have been working away um, typing through. Okay, so I'm going to take this one. What is the ideal timing for an executive MBA um, that's been asked? And I think that's something really, really important actually to think about um, because when you're looking at an executive MBA program, um, you, you want to have two things really. You want to have enough experience um, under your belt to be able to bring it to the classroom, not just to contribute, um, but also to reflect on, to enable when, when information is presented to you, you can think about experiences you had in the past and apply it to that and therefore essentially get, get more value. Um, so you want to have a good amount of experience and that doesn't just have to be in years, the quality of that experience, the different things that you've done. Um, and you also want to think about future value. Um, so, you know, your executive MBA is going to you know, pay off for a number of years in terms of your skills, in terms of your network, in terms of your profile. Um, so, you know, whereas, you know, if, you, if you're thinking um, about doing an executive MBA in two or three years, um, in order to have enough experience, that's great. If you think you've got enough experience now, then the sooner that you'd look to kind of move forward with that, um, so you need look to move forward with that, then the more value you'll start getting back from that as well. Okay, it's going to be another question. My battery's just gone. Uh, so we've got time for a, a few more. Thank you so much for all your engagement. Right, so. Okay, David, David, we've been in touch. You've got a good question. As an executive MBA student, is it possible to participate or enroll in the research centers like the Impact Lab and how we can find out um, more about the projects they are working on? So we do have a number of um, labs and research centers at the school and, um, and a lot of them are incredibly exciting. So I, I appreciate the interest there. Um, for some of those programs, they are have been built for the people who are on the full time MBA, just in terms of the structure and how they're timetabled into the structure of that program. Um, so the Impact Lab would be one of those um, that's that's only for full time MBA students and is essentially part of their program, but not everybody does it on the program. However, if you look at the Impact Lab, um, that's just one element of, of the Skoll Centre's offering. So they have many different um, events which are open to all of our students and they love people getting involved um, and finding out um, how they can contribute, how can they can discuss, other people to network with. Um, so they're really key for engagement across the school. So where the Impact Lab um, and, and the Finance Lab are built for the full-time students on the MBA, um, the, um, there's plenty of other opportunities to engage with those other elements of the school and lots of encouragement on our side to do so. Um, in terms of other research centres, they, they all operate differently, but generally our faculty um, I love connecting with our executive MBAs because they're established in roles, bring a lot of experience, um, usually you know, really well connected in their industry. Um, and if, for example, you're um, you know, senior professional in marketing or, um, or working in the real estate field or private equity or any of these areas where we've got really strong um, research expertise, then our faculty will be keen for you to get involved. It would vary from different research centres as to what, what that looks like. Um, so labs, generally no, but all the other things, definitely worth putting yourself out there and seeing, um, and seeing what's, um, what's available because plenty is. Right, I think I will take one more. Um, let's 
Okay, I think I think this will be the last one that we'll go for. Um, so, if I apply by the twenty fifth of January, but would like to be considered for the April scholarship. Okay, so I think this is related to another question that's come earlier, but I think I know what the question is, which is when do I apply if I want to be considered for those scholarships? Um, so, if you you should always apply by the earliest deadline. Um, However, you may not find out the outcome of scholarships decisions until further into the cycle. So say, um, as an example, say you're a female candidate, you wanted to apply early, you apply by the February deadline, you apply for all the scholarships that would apply to you. So not just the women's scholarships, maybe the director's scholarships, um, any others that would apply. You would find out first on your programme application, so whether we've offered you a place on the programme um, before you found out about the scholarships, um, because only people who've successfully applied get considered for scholarships. So if you applied by the February deadline and your application was successful, you'd first have an offer of a place on the programme. You would then find out about the director's awards because they're made at every deadline, okay, uh, apart from the final one. So you, then you'd find out whether you've, you've been awarded a director's award. Um, and if you have, great. Um, and if not, you will find out about the other awards later. So the Women's Awards, and this could also apply to the Hashmat Patel Award or the Oxford Alumni Awards, you would not find out until later in the cycle, probably more maybe May or early June kind of time. Um, you would find out about them at that point. Um, if you had been awarded a Director's Award, and then you'll also be considered a successful candidate, for example, the Women's Scholarship or the Oxford Alumni Scholarship, you would never be able to take both those awards. You'd have to decide which award you'd like to take up. And in most cases, obviously you take up the larger award. Um, so, you know, you would be considered for everything you applied for, but it may be you're considered or you would be considered at different times in accordance with the deadlines for those scholarships. Um, if you, uh, want to await an outcome of the scholarship whilst um, before committing to the programme, you can certainly speak to our admissions department about that, because um, it may be they won't lapse your offer if they understand that's, that's what you're keen to do. Um, but it also